Hello, and welcome to the live printing impressions and implant impressions webinar, Understanding the Economics of Investing in an Inkjet Press, sponsored by Screen. I'm Patrick Henry, Senior Editor for NAPCO Media's Printing and Packaging Group, and the moderator of today's program. Before we get started, let me take a moment to point out the Tips for Attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the Tech Tips video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click on this widget for more information. If the slides are hard to see, uh, you can enlarge them with the controls on the upper right corner of the slide window. You can download the slides using the green icon with the arrow and the folder. Now, our speaker today is an expert in both the nuts and bolts and the dollars and cents of high-volume production inkjet printing. I'm very pleased to welcome back Aaron Allenson, Production Product Manager, High Speed Inkjet, Screen Americas. Aaron has a lot of very valuable information to share with us today, and I want to turn the program right over to him. But as a preface, let me briefly mention a few of the things that NAPCO Research has learned about the industry's attitude toward inkjet as a production technology. A few years ago, we surveyed more than 700 printing businesses, including 351 commercial firms and 185 implants, to find out about their experiences with inkjet. About 43% of all the respondents owned one or more pieces of inkjet equipment, with half of them owning their presses for more than three years. Now, most of these adopters told us that they were satisfied customers. For example, they reported that deploying production inkjet, in other words, getting the equipment installed and up and running, uh, had gone as expected, easier or much easier than expected, 80% of the time. And we didn't hear much buyer's remorse either. A large majority in each of the segments we covered said they were satisfied or very satisfied with their moves into inkjet. As you can see here, three of the segments expressed no dissatisfaction at all. But here's what really clinches the argument in favor of inkjet, return on investment. This chart shows that printers in our survey group met or exceeded their pre-purchase ROI expectations for production inkjet more than 80% of the time. But it didn't happen by accident. These printers knew what they needed to do in order to obtain the ROI that they wanted. Explaining how that works is Aaron's part of the program, and I'm happy to ask him to take it from here, but please remember to send him your question using the Q&A button. We'll reserve the last 15 minutes or so of the program to get to as many of your questions as we can. Aaron, please go ahead. <coughs> Hi there, guys. Um, first of all, thanks very much for having me. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, you can see the dollar signs across the printer here. You're going to find that that's the common thread of my, my conversation today. From my perspective, as uh, people in business, your primary goal is those dollar signs. There's lots of other things that go into getting to those, but that's really where pretty much everything I talk about today is going to point towards at the end or somewhere in the beginning even. Um, before I get too deep into that, just a quick second. Um, I've been at, tell you a little bit about myself. I've been at Screen for a little over nine years. I've been on the 520 team, which is the, our high speed inkjet line for that entire time. But I've been in the industry since 86. And I've worked uh, in commercial printers. I've worked in small print shops, big print shops financial printers, uh, and then I've worked for some of the other manufacturers as well as a screen. And I've, I've done a number of different jobs. My point for saying that is I've, I've really had a good bit of experience on both sides of the fence, if you will. Um, things that are important to me uh, in terms of how I try to best serve companies like yours is I really try hard to listen to what you're saying and learn from your perspective. I try to really understand what's important to you. Uh, sometimes it's what's not being said that's actually the most important thing. I really try to keep an eye and an ear out for that sort of thing. Uh, and then when it comes to solutions, um, that's a big part of my job, but I, I'm, I'm a realist. I, I, I don't take the laboratory version or the rose, world through rose-colored glasses version. I know at some point the rubber has to meet the road and you guys have to get production out. 
And that's where those dollars come into play. Uh, and the biggest thing, biggest part of my job probably is that I take all that listening and learning, that understanding and the solutions that I discuss with you, and I bring that back to our factory. And they look at how they can bake it into the next great piece of equipment or the next great piece of software. So what are the goals for today? This talk is all about economics. Um, and and that's, that's the big goal. So what do we do to get there? I'm going to go over and hopefully give you guys a better understanding of what questions you need to ask and expect answers on. Uh, how, we, how to find fully burdened, actually true costs. What does it actually cost you to own and operate one of these things? Uh, how to turn those costs into a total cost of ownership, which is how you determine if I'm going to make money or not. Kind of important. And what's the cost of quality, which sounds a little funny, but I think that'll make sense. We're going to get into the quality aspect first because we're going to spend, we're going to do that fairly quickly and spend the most amount of time on the money portions of this. So again, you'll notice if you look at these four little blocks here, the word cost is in there somehow on all of them because that's what it's all about. So quality at what cost, uh, fixed, variable, and what I call mixed costs, which we'll get into. What's the total cost of ownership? And at the end, we'll get into what I think are very important topics when someone is considering buying a high-speed inkjet printer, and that's about mitigating the risk. This is a, a leap of faith, right? It's much less of a leap of faith today than it was eight or nine years ago, but it's still very different, and there's some risk. So, but there's ways to mitigate that risk, right? Talk about roll paper. I think, you know, before I joined screen, I had only really worked with sheeted paper, except for a financial printer I worked for where we had a web press, right? Um, Productivity, and what's the cost of productivity? So let's just take a minute to talk about quality because I think quality is one of those things that's often thought of in absolute terms, and it doesn't really have to be absolute, right? Uh, here's an example. So these are the headphones I use. I got them from Amazon. They're about $18, $19, something like that. For me, they're fine. I can make calls on them. I can listen to music. I can listen to audiobooks, podcasts. My teenager requires beats. They're both good quality, but one of them costs about four times as much as the other. And printing is no different, right? Even on a litho press, something I believe all of you are very familiar with, right? Customer sends in an RFQ. You go to uh, estimate the job or quote on the job. Do they want to process only? Well, that's one cost. Well, if the job has, let's say, a reflex blue and maybe a gold or silver, that's a different cost, process plus two, right? What if we want to add an aqueous coating to give it a little shine, right? What if we want to add a spot varnish to make it pop in certain areas? All of those can be and are good quality, but each one costs a little more than the last. And really what it comes down to is, what is the customer going to pay for? Because if they're only going to pay for the process plus two spots and you add the aqueous coating or the spot varnish and the aqueous coating, your costs are higher or going up compared to what they're paying, and so you're making less money. Inkjet is no different. There are varying levels of quality in Inkjet. And the exact, just like with Litho, the exact same Inkjet press can be set up to run job A at very, very high quality, or job B at a very good quality, very sellable quality, but at a lower cost to produce. Image Test Labs is an independent company that uh, has been in the printing in our business for a very long time. They ran this side-by-side -side test. Uh, they first ran uh, a roll through our uh, 520 HD printer, and they only printed half the sheet. The other half was left blank. We then sheeted that roll and we sent it to Cobra Press in Rochester, New York. And Cobra ran the exact same file on the other side of the sheet. And I will tell you, we'll be happy to send you one. If you look at them, it's very hard to tell the difference between which one was printed inkjet and which one was printed litho. Quality is there, right? 
but you don't always need, not every customer needs that level of quality. To get to that level of quality, maybe it costs you more because you might slow the machine down and you might push the ink more. More ink means more cost, right? Maybe most customers are very happy to, for you to run at full speed and use a normal amount of ink and give them very, very sellable quality. Um, so what's the answer? Do you run the job as process only or do you do the proverbial process plus two spots plus varnish plus an aqueous coating? The answer is you do the one that wins you the job and makes you the most money. So if you have to push quality really hard and really push the ink to win the job, you do it. But most customers, the vast majority of customers, don't need that extended level, just like the vast majority of your customers don't necessarily need two spots plus varnish plus aqueous. So there's really, I have two, technically there's really three categories, and we'll get into the third one uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but fixed costs, these are costs that happen whether you run the machine or not, right? Variable costs, these are the costs that are directly connected to how much you run. And then mixed cost is kind of what I would call mixed cost is kind of a little bit of both. So when we're going through this costing, um, we're going to go back to fifth grade math, right? we're going to find between the fixed, how do you marry up the fixed variable and mixed costs? You find a common denominator. And the common denominator we're going to use, or that I have found, is the easiest to use, is one month. So we're going to put together one month's worth of fixed costs, one hypothetical month worth of variable costs, and one hypothetical month worth of mixed costs. Now, when you actually start to look at buying these machines, you don't have to use hypothetical. You should, be actual, you should be able to get actual real costs from whatever manufacturers you're working with. They should be able to tell you, here's what this cost is going to be. Here's what that cost is going to be. And you're going to plug it in. I'm going to show you real quickly how our hypothetical costs come together. But when you're ready to do it, you're going to obviously use real costs. So we've got our months. We're going to take this out to a year at first, and then we're going to back it down to a month. Right, so we've got our printer loan payment, right? That's the payment to the bank. They don't care how much you run the machine. You're making your payment to them every month. What if you bought finishing equipment? You have service on the machine. Keep in mind, these are all just kind of made up numbers. They're not real numbers. They're just here to kind of show you guys how this comes together. Maybe your parts contract only gets paid twice a year. Maybe your software licensing only gets paid four times a year. You've got to manage your salary. Managers do uh, some, spend some portion of their time thinking about, making decisions about the machine. They actually expect to get paid, so it makes sense to allocate some portion of their time and their pay towards this cost center. There's some other things that go on. You have to put lights on over the machine. There's a, a maintenance guy who cleans up around the machine, or janitorial, I should say. Um, what does that all add up to? Well, we add it all up, and then we divide it by 12, and we get an average fixed cost per month. So that 27042 based on these numbers, is pretty darn close to what it's going to cost us for, per month to own this machine, right? And keep in mind, hypothetical in this conversation, it's different for every person. There's different equipment, different ways people are going to run the machine, different ink set. There's tons of things that make it uh, specific to you. And when you're working with the, the manufacturer, whether it's us, we hope it's us, at least that you're, you're working with in addition to someone else, but um, we'll be able to give you real costs. And that's what you can plug in. So that's going to include things like capital equipment, your printer service and parts, software licensing, uh, any renewals, maintenance. you got to ask about these things because not everyone will actually come right out and tell you about it because you might not even see these costs until after the machine is installed. So you got to ask, what are the other costs that are going to come up? Is this, um, this price I'm going to pay the final price or is this a 
a monthly price, a quarter, or a yearly? What's the contract? What's that look like, right? Finishing equipment, if you have to buy finishing equipment, what are your service costs? Management salary, we talked a little bit about. It actually takes up space in your building. What if you have to do a build out or add some type of infrastructure, whether it's electricity or uh, some evacuation unit for heat or scrap paper that a finishing line um, makes when it uh, processes your web into sheets? Uh, all those things should be taken into account. What if there's, if you have to add air conditioning because the printer you bought generates a ton of heat? And then you might have a little miscellaneous area where it's just things like, like I mentioned before, the janitor or someone has to move paper to and from the printer, they don't work for free, stuff like that. So um, those are the biggies, right? So we're gonna take that 27042, and we're gonna pop it in right up here in the top left so we can keep track of it, because those are our average fixed costs per month. So mixed costs, so labor and electricity are really the main mixed costs. And what I mean by that is you might need, um, you might run two shifts, but if you don't run all of the second shift, you still have to pay your operator for the time that they're at the plant. They might be doing other jobs part of the time. Um, it's, it's hard to make that just a fixed cost and it's hard to make it just a variable cost. So labor falls into that. Electricity goes up and down based on how much time you're running the machine. So there's idle electricity amount that's being used and when you're actually printing, right? But don't discount electricity. Don't ignore electricity. I can tell you that for similar, very similar printers, some people, there, some printers, their, manu their electric bill is in the, let's say, three to $4,000 a month range, and there's other printers that produce the same work, and then they're in the $12,000 a month electric bill range. Um, just very different philosophies on how to dry that ink. And some just blast it with heat, and air, and some have a more engineered ink that does most of the drying on its own. Got to find out about that. Got to ask, what's your kilowatt usage, right? So let's figure out our hours per month. So there's definitely some things that you can find out for sure this is what it's going to cost. Some things you're going to have to estimate a guess on, right, or guesstimate. So Think about, about once you get going, not at the very beginning, but once you get going and you have a few months under your belt of running the machine, whichever machine it is, about how many hours per month do you think reasonably you can expect to run the machine? A month's worth of work days, Monday through Friday, is about 21 days per month, approximately. It varies. If you figure one and a half to two shifts per, per day, you're running about 250 to 335 hours per month, okay? We're gonna take, because that's not the full month, those, that's the time we would be quote unquote running, we're gonna multiply that by the electricity and the labor rates. So we're gonna take that 293 hours, and it's average, right? It's a guesstimate. And we're gonna put it up here on the top left. For electricity, what we're going to do is we're going to find out the kilowatts that the printer used. Again, the manufacturer should be able to tell that. Not only the printer, but the winders, the dryers, if that's separated, the chillers. There's servers that go with it. Um, there might be other finishing equipment. There is a kilowatt rating for all of those. And you add all those kilowatts up, and you multiply the number of hours, and then you have your kilowatt, you have your kilowatt rate. Right, and so you're make, multiplying your kilowatt rate by 293 hours in this case. Labor, same thing. You're just gonna take your fully burdened labor rate. If you pay your person $18 an hour, you, won't, you don't wanna multiply that 293 by 18, right? You won't actually wanna, uh, because there's overhead cost that. There's benefits uh, and things like that that add to that. So maybe that turns out to be $27 an hour or something like that. So that's the number, that's the fully burdened rate, labor rate. Okay, so 
we're going to take that 27,042. That's our fixed. We've got 293 hours up here. We're going to take that 293, multiply it by 28. We're just calling that 28 your fully burdened labor rate. That adds up to 8,204. Then you're going to take that 293 hours, let's say after you added it all up from the various hardware that is in involved, uh, maybe it adds up to 350 kilowatts. You're going to multiply that by 293 hours, and then you're going to look at your kilowatt rate that is on your electric bill, and you're going to multiply that by, by those, those numbers, right? 11 cents an hour per kilowatt hour, right? Well, as you can see, for a machine that uses 350 kilowatts worth of electricity, that turns out to be a big number. For some printers, our printers don't use this much. Our printers are less than half of this, okay? But some aren't. You got to check into that. You can't just say electricity is electricity. When you combine all that, we'll add that 27042, that 8204, and then 11280, and we'll add it all up. And our fixed and mixed costs turn out to be 46, basically 46.5 per month. So we're going to pop that up here so we can keep track of that number. And remember, we're going to hold on to that 46.5, right? Because that's going to becoming going to become important soon. Um, and we're going to start to add in our variable costs. So the big variable costs are paper, ink. If there's a click, that's important to know what that click is. That's a variable cost. Some companies, we're not one of them, some companies charge for heads. As a head, heads are consumables in inkjet printing. They, if a, a paper strikes the head, it could ruin a head. If dust gets on the head, it can ruin a head. There's uh, heads that are easily ruined and heads that are very robust. Screen happens to have a little bit of a different philosophy there. We use extremely robust heads. It really takes a lot to kill one of our heads. And beyond that, we actually, because they're so robust, we cover them under our service contract. Not everyone does that. They'll say, they might say, you're going to use head, a head. A head is going to last X number of liters. You're going to want that in writing, right? You're going to want them to guarantee that, and you're not going to know what happens if it doesn't. And they got to have a good answer for you. This is your business, right? Because when it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, and the answer is they say, I'm sorry, here's another head, that doesn't cover your costs. Um, so continuing on, one month's worth of variable costs. We need to know how to make up a hypothetical month's worth of variable costs, right? We have to kind of estimate what work we can put on the printer and then we can start to determine what does it cost to actually produce that work, okay? You don't have the printer yet, so this is not so easy. It's not cut and dry where you can just open up your uh, MIS system and look at, you know, the last several months' worth of work and, and uh, figure out the details, figure out the answers. You've got to make some assumptions. So as you think about the types of work that you're going to put on it, whether it's uh, table tents or letter work or posters, calendar work, signage, whether you're doing pads or self-mailers or letter packages, whatever it is, again, assumptions and estimates on this, right? We don't have hard numbers yet. So this is, this is a little bit of what's our best guess kind of thing going on. What percent of your work makes up the letter work that you're going to do? What percent of your total amount of work that you're going to do on this printer makes up book work? And so on and so forth. And at the end of it, you kind of need to get to 100%. So this does not have to be exact. You, what you do here has to be ballpark. Okay? It doesn't have to be exact because everything is going to get averaged out, and it's just going to remember we're not using this to quote on a job. What we're using it to do is to um, do a apples to apples comparison between different printers from different OEMs, right? Um, I would think about it from a busy months perspective and a slow months perspective. The reason is uh, those, whether you're busy or slow, 
greatly impacts how you amortize these fixed costs, this 46,526. Again, it doesn't have to be exact. We're just putting a stake in the ground, something that we can work off of. Once you have an idea of what representative samples you're going to run or you're going to work off of, you're going to want the OEMs to run those samples, whether it's, again, letter work, book work, postcards, signage, pads, whatever else you have figured out is going to make up your, your month's worth of work, right, to your best guess. You're going to have the OEMs run samples, not just provide ink numbers, run samples. Because remember, at the beginning, I said, you can have an OEM or a printer really push the ink, and it will look amazing. But the amount of ink used is going to be higher, and so the cost can be higher. Well, conversely, if someone's only providing ink numbers, they might say, uh, I'm, going to scale the, I'm going to scale this back to uh, a very low amount of ink used, and when I report my ink numbers, I'll be able to say it was based on this, right? You're going to want to run samples, find the samples that actually um, match or uh, get to the level of quality that you believe will be sellable to your customers or your, cu uh, yeah, to, to your customers, right? Um, some things that might be helpful for you to provide when you ask the OEM to make samples you might consider giving them a proof to match. I wouldn't necessarily go with the, um, the Rolls-Royce proof or the um, process plus two uh, spots plus uh, varnish plus aqueous proof. Give them the proof that you think is uh, sellable, right? Or you might say to them, conform to swap or to grackle or some other standard or specification. You could also ask them if you just wanted to see how far can we go? You might say in terms of uh, color gamut, you might say push it to the maximum gamut, right? Your ink costs are gonna go up for that. But at least that'll give you an idea of how far can you go. Uh, and then think about the level that most of your customers or the, most of the OEM's customers run. You might say to them, where do your customers run at? Where do most of your customers run? If they run at a, you know, let's say a, a 160, or do most of them run at a 140? These are arbitrary numbers. But or does most of them run at a 100? Where do most of your customers run? Show me what those would look like and what those ink costs would be. Um, what you should expect in return. This is important, right? You're going to want to know what the ink cost per piece at what per liter cost, because the uh, OEM might give you the first set of samples at one per liter ink cost. And then as the conversation continues, that per liter ink cost might change. And now that ink cost per piece is going to change as well. So you need to know where you stand. Um, is there any click? You have to add that in. What is the paper cost? CWT is cost per hundred weight. And you can convert that or they can convert that into a cost per piece or cost per thousand feet, right? Because CWT, the way you buy web paper is you buy it by the hundred cost per pound, basically, or cost per hundred pounds is CWT. And so a hundred pounds of 60 pound offset that's 18 inches wide is a different cost than a hundred pounds of 60 pound offset that's 20 inches wide. It's also a different cost per foot than 100 pound cover 18 inches wide for 100 pounds of paper. You can imagine how you get more or less linear footage based on that kind of detail, but the mills charge by the pound. It's a little bit different from sheets. Um, there are definitely some tools out there that can help you with that, and certainly the OEM should be able to educate you on the difference between roll based and sheet based paper. We'll get into that uh, towards the end of the deck a little bit. Um, and then you're also going to want them to annotate any settings or identifiers, right? You might have them run the same job a couple of different ways, right? One at uh, different speeds or different, maybe you have them run it at Grackle, and you might also have them run the same job uh, how their customers run, how the OEM's customers typically run. And then you're going to want to know speed and resolution that each job is run at. Those are really the important things to know when you're looking at samples provided by an OEM.
One thing I'm going to say is speed can be a gotcha. And the way, the reason I say that, it's important to know this stuff or important to have this stuff documented because you might say to the OEM, I want you to run, you know, like production. I want you to run it like you're running production and it's got to look good. And they may say internally, well, the way we make it look the best is we slow the printer down and go to a higher resolution. And they give you the samples and they look great and you're really happy with them, but you don't find out till later that they ran it at 40 meters a minute or something, which is basically, uh, you know, like 120 feet per minute. Um, gets a little more than that, maybe 130. Um, that's not a speed you can run production at, right? When the, the, the other OEM ran it at 100 meters per minute, which is th almost 330 feet per minute, right? So you got to make sure you know what speed they ran it at. I'm actually going to back up a second. One other thing on these costs per piece, when you finally settle on whatever vendor you're going to work with, whatever OEM you're going to work out with, one thing I would suggest is make them commit that you too will be able to get to these costs per piece that they said you could get to at the speed and resolution they said they ran at. Uh, Screen is willing to commit to that kind of thing contractually. And once we install the machine, part of acceptance is getting to these numbers. Uh, whoever you decide to go with, make sure that they that's how you keep us honest, right? That's one of the ways. Okay, so we're gonna take those things, all those numbers, that 46,526, uh, and we're gonna start to turn that into measurable information, right? Um, the 46,526 and the variable cost, the costs that come from running those samples, and we're going to look at the speeds the jobs run at. We're going to convert that to pieces per hour. So if they say, let's say this is a, an eight and a half by 11, and it was run at 100 meters per minute or 150 meters per minute, which is just barely under 500 feet per minute, we're going to convert that to pieces per hour. If you run them two up, that's a little under 1,000 pieces per minute, so a little under 60,000 pieces per hour, right? So we can, we can convert that speed and the size of the job, size of the piece, to a pieces per hour, okay? Um, and why we do that will become apparent in a minute. We'll fill out your hypothetical 293 hours worth of work. By the way, a little realism check. If you figure out 293 hours worth of work, 293 hours worth of work is really about 205 print hours. Uh, it's just realistic. It's not that the machine is going to be down. It's things like you have morning maintenance to do. It's things like, oh, their customer made a last minute change and we have to make new files. It's things like, well, I was waiting for the roll of paper to come out and I was sitting, I've been sitting here for the last 15 minutes and the guy hasn't brought it out yet. There's realistic things that happen inside of a print shop that causes this number to get degraded. And so in order to be safe so that your numbers aren't, um, like I said before, looking at the world through rose-colored glasses, they're realistic numbers, put in a 70% factor. That will keep you safe. You'll exceed that, but you're safe. And when you do exceed that, you'll beat your numbers. You don't want to be on the other side of that and miss your numbers. That's why I use 70%. Um, and now we're going to work out your cost per piece. So we took that 293 and we made it 205 hours because we're going to keep that in mind. So here's what that starts to look like. And I just picked a few jobs. Again, these are all hypothetical. They're made up numbers. Let's say these are the speeds we ran these, these different types of work at, right? A postcard. Um, runs at a different speed than a letter. Let's say it's a six by nine postcard, right? Um, or a book that is a different size and different paper, runs at a different speed and pads are smaller so you can get more out per hour. What percent of the work? Remember a few slides ago I said, try to guesstimate what percent of your work each of these things is gonna make up. what percent of 205 hours. So these are, this is percent, 
this is hours of that 205 hours, right? Letters are going to take, based on our guesstimations, about 59, almost 60 hours per month. Postcards, a little under 20 hours per month, and so on and so forth. So what does that work out to in, two, in terms of pieces per month? So if you add all this up, it adds up to about 11,100,000 pieces per month, right? We're going to use that number in a minute. What's your ink cost per piece? Remember, the OEM was supposed to provide this. What's your cost per piece? And just the ink portion of it. What's your paper cost per piece? The, uh, the OEM is going to help you with that. You might, by the way, with paper costs, you might call up your merchant and say, how much is paper when I buy it by the roll? We'll get into it more in a little bit in a couple more slides. But in general, paper by the roll is anywhere from 10 to as much as 20% less than the exact same paper in sheeted format. But you can get that information from your paper merchant. What if there are clicks and heads? You've got to factor that in. So if, um, if there's clicks per however many thousand feet, you're going to divide this number by the length and determine the, the cutoff length, determine how many feet, and you're going to factor in your clicks. If they're heads per liter uh, or however they're measured, right, you're going to factor that in. And you can figure out about how much ink, or it should actually be on the the information that the OEM provides back, or they can provide that back. Um, and you can factor in how many heads am I going to use on this job? Obviously, you may run this job in reality, you may run this job and not use any heads, or you may run the next job, which is smaller, and blow through two heads. But this is averages it out, right? We're going to add all that up, ink and paper. I didn't include click here because we don't charge clicks and we don't charge for heads. So uh, in this case, I'm just adding ink and paper. I take that number, right? This is clicks, or it does not include clicks and heads. This is ink and paper, and if you add all these up, it equals 158,466. I'm going to put that number up there because that's our variable costs. Incidentally, if we divide this 158,466 by this 11.1 .1 million, we get an average cost of ink and paper, variable costs, of 1.43 cents per piece. That's our average, right? So these numbers we're going to carry over and use them in a minute. So we take our fixed costs, fixed and mixed. We add in our variable costs. We've got our 11.1 .1 million in terms of number of pieces per month. And we're going to add these things up and divide them by the 11.1 .1 million. And fully burdened, fully burdened costs, that's capital equipment costs, service costs, labor costs, electricity, paper, ink, all the things that we accounted for, we can turn that into a single number. We can turn that into, in this case, just under two cents per piece, all up, all in. And what that does, that single number, if you have each of the OEMs go through that same process, that rinse and repeat, and you put us through the same set of steps, you give us the same files, and you get each of us get to an acceptable level of quality, and you go through this process, you can compare us all by a single number. Right? Now I'm under no illusion that it's that easy. Obviously, there's a lot more to it. What are the what's the relationship like, right? You're forming a long-term relationship with this OEM. So what are the people like that you have to work with? Right? How are they supported? How am I going to be supported? Is this company going to be someone who, when there's a disagreement, understands my perspective and works with me? Or are they going to say, you know what, we're, you know, we're like a, a big freight train. We're good at going forward. We're not good at turning left and right and being nimble for our customers, right? They, might, they won't say those exact words, but you'll see by their answer to how they help you deal with the problem, right? So all those things factor in. But in terms of costs, this allows you to get to one number and then compare us across one number. It allows you to do that apples to apples comparison. Now, I am under no illusion this is a significant amount of work and it's multiplied by however number OEMs you work with. But 
it's a way to get us all on the same playing field, to boil all of those costs down that come in at different rates and different times, variable, fixed, mixed, and get us all to a common denominator and to this one single number. So that kind of covers our costs, but let's talk about some of the other things. By the way, at the end of this, I'm gonna put up my email address for anyone who wants to, any one of you guys, if you have questions, you want to talk about something, shoot me an email. If we need, if I can answer you over email, I will. If we're not, we'll get on the phone and talk through something. More than happy to answer any questions. I'll put my email up on the last slide. So how do we mitigate risk, right? How do we, this is a little bit of a leap of faith. This is something brand new. We've never really done it before, right? So pick two, three, four customers, their actual work. Right? Maybe it's a company you lost the business of. Maybe it's a company that you've been on the work, but you've never really won it. Maybe it's your best customers. You make the decision there. And you have samples run of their work by the OEMs. Right? And you get that same information back. They're going to give you the variable costs, and they should give it to you very, very accurately. You take your fixed costs. Take out the variable costs that we've been working on the last few slides, just work off of those fixed costs that you came up with, the fixed and mixed costs, and divide by that 11.1 million, what you think you're going to be doing. So those fixed and mixed costs come out, in our case, to be 0 .004, so four-tenths of a penny per piece. Then you're going to take the variable costs that you got from that specific run or those specific runs for those customers of yours or companies that you want to be your customers, those opportunities, and you're going to add them together and then determine what markup do you want to add on this? What do you want your sell price to be? And you can show it to them. You have hard copy printed samples. You know pretty darn close what it costs you to make those. Now you can actually go to your customer and show it to them and say, hey, is this, would this get you, would this work for you? Would you buy it? Right? And here's the price that we would need to sell it at. And that means that you've got buy-in from your customers. So let's talk a little bit about rolls versus sheets. Okay, I mentioned before you buy it by the pound, not the foot. It's in general 10 to 20 percent less expensive than buying paper via sheets. You can often buy more efficient with paper due to size. So as an example, if I'm let's say running a 40-inch press. Uh, it's a 2840, and my piece size is 30 inches long. Maybe it's a, a 6 by 30, right? Well, you can only run that 30 inches across the 40-inch width of the machine. And so unless you can buy paper, maybe at 31 or 32 inches for a little space around, you're going to be stuck buying 40-inch sheets. That means you're going to have 8 to 10 inches of wasted paper on every single sheet by whatever the other dimension gets you. Whereas Inkjet Press has basically uh, an infinitely incremented cutoff. You can have, run an eight and a half by 11 and set your cutoff to 11 inches or 11 and a quarter, whatever you want, if there are bleeds or depending on the situation, or if it's a 30 inch length, you can set it to 30 inches. The printers can be very efficient from that perspective. Something you should know about roll paper, it's not as, even, not as convenient to get as sheets. I remember working for commercial printers. We need something in the afternoon and, uh, or the next day, we'd call in the afternoon. Our paper merchant could bring it over in the truck the next morning. There, even times they'd say, we can't get it to you, but if you can send a truck over, we'll load you up. Uh, you guys know how that is. Rolls aren't quite so easy. Um, uh, there's ways around that. You work with your paper merchant for on stocking programs. Um, you can have what we what what most of our customers do is they settle on some house stocks, and those are the ones that if you need a job in some kind of um, timed manner, you got to pick one of the house stocks. If the job is going to be scheduled or it's going to be more contractual work, we know what's coming in every month then we can use whatever paper you want and we can just work out a deal with the merchants. Um, the other thing about roll stock is this not as quick to load for short runs. For long runs, it's probably quicker to load than a, a full stack. 
I'm almost getting to the end. I'm getting a note saying I need to hurry up because I want to give time for Q&A. I really went fast because there was a lot to cover. Um, there's a free app. It's a little shameless plug, a free app that helps you understand roll paper. And what it does is it lets you plug in information and turns in CWT to actual cost per thousand feet or per piece or convert GSM to pounds. Take a look. It's free app. It's uh, many, many of my customers have used it. I, I wrote it for them, and there's no reason why you can't use it. Um, judging what quality will sell. I'm going to go really fast here. Um, my suggestion or one idea is get the samples from the OEMs, put them up on the wall, invite your stakeholders in from your company or even customers, give them each three Post-it notes. Have them put a post-it note on what they think most of your customers will say, that's totally fine, right? And that's going to tell you which ones are out and which ones are just fine, and now you can base your decisions on cost, right? I'm not even going to spend time on our printers. We have uh, two main family lines of printers, and now I'll turn it over for the Q&A. Sorry for going so fast, especially at the end. Uh, Aaron, uh, forgive us for, for hustling you along. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for that master class in inkjet investment and ROI. That is some amazingly good guidance, particularly for, uh, for first-time buyers. But I would like to get to, to uh, a few questions from the audience. Uh, uh, at least one person has asked how we can obtain uh, that comparison test sheet from Image Test Labs. Can we do that by following up uh, with you, by dropping you an email? Absolutely. Send me an email. Um, and we'll get a sample out to you. Okay. Um, here's a question. How do we financially account for the flush line of choice? And I'm assuming that means a, a press component that we need to fit into the calculation somewhere. Does that, uh, that question make sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense, and it's a good question. Uh, I don't know how our competitors do it. Screen, you can't print without the flushing line. If you do, then your heads will clog. So screen uh, includes the cost of that flushing line in our ink numbers that we provide to you as, that, as part of that variable cost. So we're including it. I can't speak to what our competitors do. Um, Aaron, over, over time, can the cost of operating an inkjet press change? Uh, could the press that I install today cost me more or perhaps less to run, say, three years from now? Um, I mean, in a sense, it, it can. Your fixed costs can, um, let's say you're, you're, you're running a shift and a half uh, per month uh, today, and then in two years, you're running two shifts, you're, you're busier, then in three years, you're really booked and you're running three shifts, and maybe you're starting to run uh, run into the sixth and seventh day and, and busy times, those things allow you to amortize those fixed costs across a greater number. We use that 11.1 .1 million to divide those fixed costs, but what if now you're running 16 million per month? You can, you can divide that across a bigger number. Um, you may finish off your payment for the capital equipment, although depending on how you want to account for that uh, in terms of depreciation, um, that may even be before three years, right? That may, it depends on your accounting principles for that. So in some ways, definitely. Uh, Aaron, as I'm sure you know, uh, there, there is some concern uh, about uh, the cost of uh, inkjet ink. Uh, that's even perceived by some as perhaps a, a barrier to adoption, you know, correctly or incorrectly. So the uh, question here is, you know, how can I give my clients the color quality that they expect, but you know, still hold the line on ink coverage, consumption, and, and cost? That's a really good question. And I will tell you that there are some customers where you have to really push ink. We've done samples for a company that makes greeting cards, and there's no way around it. You have to push the ink on that. And those costs per card is higher. And then very recently, I have a, an existing customer that they called us. They said they had an opportunity that their ink costs were too high. Uh, we work with them using color management to um, 
get the quality they needed that their customer will buy and reduce their ink usage 35% in this case. Um, it's not always that easy, but the short answer is it depends on the situation, and if you're using good color management, then you have a lot of opportunity to do that. And that, that's key. I didn't really talk about it during the, during the deck, but screen, you know, if an OEM's goal is for you to use as much ink as possible, they're going to let you run the way that you run. They're going to say push ink. They're going to um, do things or not necessarily do things to help you reduce your own ink consumption. Screen has a different philosophy. We're more about happy customers, and over time, you'll use the ink you use. And so we not only teach uh, color management, we preach it. We um, are always looking for the best possible color management tools, and we're showing those to our customers and not only uh, offering them to them, but we're supporting them in terms of teaching them how to use it and using them the best way possible. So it's... It's very much about the ink. Ink and dollars, or in inkjet printing, ink and dollars, the exact same thing. Uh, Aaron, someone has asked if there are any maintenance costs outside the monthly expense, and this I think relates to a, another question I wanted to ask you. But there are, are there any maintenance uh, costs that uh, typically aren't accounted for, as uh, as you've just described? Uh, it I guess it depends on your maintenance plan. I can't speak for the other OEMs. Uh, screens, service plans, uh, at least we have options, but the most common option is complete coverage, bumper to bumper. So for us, we include things like inkjet heads. Uh, we include the filters. We include all the things that people think of as consumables other than ink. Those kinds of things are included in our service plan. Right, ink is not included in service plans. Uh, uh, I had a lot of customers ask me that. Unfortunately, it's uh, not the case. But for us, everything else is. So you don't you don't see a bill if someone has to fly in or spend the night uh, or eat food, uh, whether it takes them you know five minutes or an hour and a half to fix something. You don't see a bill um, because that's all covered by your service plan. Here's an interesting uh, question about color management. It reads, is the color management process to reduce ink consumption like undercolor replacement as found with litho? litho. And I guess uh, what we're asking here is, are, are there equivalents to UCR and GCR and inkjet as we, as we have in litho as a way maybe to reduce ink consumption? Yes, um, very similar. I guess I'll say yes and more. So um, with litho, uh, it's a little, you don't, it's not digital, right? It's analog. So you don't have quite the same control as you do with inkjet. Plus there's the fact that you're chasing ink water balance. So there's some limitations to litho. You can use UCR or GCR. Um, we can do that in inkjet as well. We also, Screen also has a uh, proprietary uh, color management system called AIA. It's very similar to those. But because we understand exactly where our inks are, how we drive, how our machine is jetting them down, we're adding another layer on top of that that we have found by working with customers like you guys that we, on the same work for the same quality, are using less ink. I will tell you, at the end of the day, you can get hung up on what's the cost per liter, and you should. Cost per liter matters, right? But if uh, OEM A has a cost per liter of $50 per liter, or an OEM B has a cost per liter of $30 per liter, that doesn't mean that OEM B is printing for less than OEM A. It's really about that cost per piece at similar quality, right? Um, but the answer to that question is, yeah, we're using different techniques like um, GCR and UCR and other things to um, uh, reduce ink consumption while maintaining quality. Uh, and, and, and if you give us, if you have a, the time to take a look at us, we can show you some of the other things we're doing. I just can't show it here on um, in this, this format. Uh, we have time for a couple, uh, couple more. Uh, Aaron, in your experience, uh, are there uh, hidden costs to be really careful of? And by that, I mean costs that 
inkjet adopters, you know, either fail to anticipate or don't uh, ask enough questions about? Um, I mean, I did try. That was a big part of the reason for this presentation is try to bring those kinds of things to the light of day. Um, some examples of the ones that I have found have been overlooked by companies. Electricity is a big one. You saw that that is easily a five-figure number per month. Um, another one is heat. heat th these machines generate heat. Now, they vent the heat out, but not all the heat is vented out. So there's some that remains in the room, and it has to be air-conditioned out. They, it, you know, you have to reduce that heat. So now if you have to add in air, more air conditioning, now you're running your air conditioner more, and that's using electricity. Some of the other things that I was mentioning are click. If, if your OEM is charging a click, you have to factor that in. Heads, I've heard from uh, customers who uh, don't have a head replacement plan. They'll often receive uh, used or refurbished heads, and they'll get a head that they take out of the box to replace one, and they put it in, and it's dead on arrival. Um, I don't know what percent those are, but uh, I've heard stories about that. Um, screen kind of stays away from that sort of thing. Like I said, we include heads in our service contracts. We don't charge clicks. We don't actually have an easy way to capture clicks. So we don't know how much you're printing exactly. We do at some level in our service group, but that's not something that we, the groups that, that Bill have any access to. Okay, uh, we, we have time for uh, for one more question. A few of uh, a few have come in. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, using seventy percent of the machine hours. Uh, how much uptime can one expect contributing to uh, to that number? And that's a good question about uh, machine uptime. How much should we expect? Yeah, good. it is a good question. So it depends a little bit on how you define uptime. Uh, if you take out things like Roll change time, because it does take a few minutes to change every roll of paper, morning maintenance, um, things like that. Uh, uptime, where time where the machine is ready to be used, for us, is extremely high. I would say in the low 90s, low to mid 90s for us. Um, but you do have maintenance time. These machines are, are highly engineered, finely tuned machines, and they do have to be maintained and taken care of. Maintenance doesn't take a huge amount of time, but if you skip it, you will experience unplanned downtime. So I guess I'd say if your question is, what's the percentage of unplanned downtime? Very, very low, less than 10%. Well, uh, it looks as though uh, our time is uh, just about out for today. Uh, again, if we didn't get to your questions, uh, you can follow up uh, directly with, uh, with Aaron, as he invited you to do. Uh, on behalf of Printing Impressions and Implant Impressions and Screen, I want to thank our great speaker, and I want to thank all of you for uh, your attention today, and thank you for joining us. Uh, please be sure to check out our webinar pages, and you see them there for information about all of our archived and upcoming webinars. And if you would like to review this webinar, uh, give it a day or two, and we will be posting uh, an archive uh, with uh, sound and slides and everything within uh, within a couple of days. Uh, finally, uh, if you would uh, just take a moment to fill out the feedback uh, survey that will appear on your screen next, we would be grateful. Your feedback really does help us improve the quality of the webinars that we will bring to you in the future. Uh, we hope to see you again soon at upcoming Impressions Group webinars. Thank you again, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Um, thank you, Patrick, and thank you to all of you um, who watched. I know you're all very busy, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, again, please feel free to email me if I can help in any way. Thank you.